I have the pleasure, I think, of directly introducing Steve Breyer, um, who will be speaking next uh, uh, and introducing our final, the, the, the star, the stars. <laughs> um, uh, at the end of our, our day here, um, Josh Freeman and Eric Foner. So Steve Breyer, I am delighted to introduce. Um, he is our dear colleague at the CUNY Graduate Center. He is also sadly retiring um, and has been a member of this faculty also at the School of Labor and Urban Studies. He is a um, professor of urban education. He's the author of, uh, most recently, Austerity Blues, Fighting for the Soul of Public Higher Education. And he's also at work on a, a book about Ocean Hill-Brownsville strike, which is something that Josh also wrote about inside of Working Class New York. So I will turn it over to Steve. Thank you, Penny. Thanks very much. Um, welcome to the final reflection session, as we're calling it, uh, of the Working Class New York Revisited Conference. <laughs> had an, a, an amazing day. We had over 1,200 advanced registrants for this conference. Mm. Came in and out of, you know, of the sessions that we held from 9.30 this morning until now. Um, and the, the, today's presentations were extraordinarily rich and diverse and challenging and made us think in, in, in new and interesting ways about ways to apply the lessons that Josh speaks about in Working Class New York to the contemporary situation. Um, I hope you, many of you have stayed, uh, you know, for much, if not all of uh, today's sessions. And so we're going to basically use this session to kind of do some deep reflection. Um, I want to first, in addition to thanking the panelists who were here today, thank the dedicated staff and faculty at the School of Labor and Urban Studies for the work they did in putting this conference together and to acknowledge the co-sponsors of the project, um, the PhD program in history, the American Social History Project Center for Media and Learning and the Gotham Center for New York City History, all at the Graduate Center, the History Department at Queens College, um, uh, and the new press, especially the new press, the publisher of, of Working Class New York, all of whom made this incredible day-long conference a reality. Um, this concluding panel has been designed as a set of reflections after this long day of talk and discussion. I will first offer brief introductions of both Josh's work and my own thoughts about its importance, as well as introduce our other distinguished panel participant, Eric Foner, Eric will offer reflections about Josh as a fellow historian and a longtime colleague. And this session will then conclude with a final statement from our guest of honor. I hope and expect we will be able to finish as promised no later than 7.15 to give everyone at the conference a chance to dive into the liquor of their choice. <laughs> Supper, my only sadness is we aren't able to be together because of COVID-19 to do the imbibing together, but hopefully as they say next year. Um, what has brought us together today is a celebration of, of the phenomenally engaged scholarship and the long and illustrious career of Josh Freeman. I met Josh almost four decades ago when with a newly or freshly minted PhD in history from Muckers University, he applied for a writing position at the American Social History Project that the late Herbert Gutman and I had founded at the CUNY Graduate Center a few years earlier. Hiring Josh in 1984 to lead the writing team drafting the second post-1877 volume of the project's Who Built America textbook was among the smartest things I ever did, not only because of the stellar contributions he made to the writing of that volume, but also because he has become and remains one of my most valued colleagues and collaborators, not to speak of a, a dear friend. Even after Josh left ASHP in 1987 for more formal academic employment, he and I continued to work together, especially after he returned to CUNY in 1998 as a faculty member at both Queens College and the Graduate Center. Beyond working together at the Grad Center when Josh served as the EO of the History PhD program, 
and I worked as a senior administrator, our collaboration deepened over the past decade when we began team te tag teaming in alternate semesters teaching the graduate labor history course in the labor studies program now department, first at the Murphy Institute and then at the School of Labor and Urban Studies after Murphy became a freestanding CUNY school a few years ago. I'm delighted to acknowledge here publicly that I have never taught a labor history course or given a labor history lecture at SLU or anyone else in these last 10 years without assigning or quoting heavily from working class New York, which remains to my mind, the non pari history of post-war New York City after its publication in 2000 by the New Press. Josh has written and published over his long and distinguished career as a historian, three other major award-winning books that I wanna at least note here. Uh, first, as, as Mark Kagan mentioned, In Transit, published in 1988, uh, The Definitive Historical Study of uh, Transit Workers Union Local 100, American Empire, 1945 to 2000, published in, 19, in 2012, and most recently, Behemoth, A History of the Factory and the Making of the Modern World in 2018, each of which, like Working Class New York, is an original and incredibly insightful contribution to our understanding of the history of the working class and the international capitalist economy that all of us as workers are forced to live in and labor under. Working Class New York continues to shape and inform our historical and contemporary understanding of the importance of working class life and activism in our city in the post-war era, more than two decades after it first appeared. Josh's evocation of the social democratic ethos that defined New York City in the 1950s and 1960s not only helps us remember a history that has been buried under decades of neoliberal attacks on and falsehoods about the city's enduring commitment to the common good, but also helps us understand that if such a democratic, a social democratic city existed in the past, it is incumbent on all of us as teachers, students, workers, and activists fighting for social justice to embrace that possibility and the politics that made it possible. Working Class New York also helps us learn that the opening shot of the neoliberal war on the public sector was not Reagan's well-known and often referred to breaking of the PATCO strike in 1981, but rather the successful attack on the social democratic gains that the New York City working class had won in the three decades after the end of World War II and that were systematically unravel, unraveled after the 1975-76 New York City fiscal crisis. Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce an old friend and collaborator of mine and Josh's, Eric Foner, DeWitt Clinton Professor Emeritus at Columbia University, and author of far too many award-winning and path-breaking US history books and texts to begin to list here who will offer his own reflections uh, about Josh Freeman and Josh's contributions to historical scholarship. Eric? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. I'm uh, truly delighted to take part in the closing event of this uh, extraordinary conference. And um, I wanna start by just congratulating and thanking the organizers, uh, those who worked, Steve, but the, other, the others who worked often behind the scenes, putting together an event like this is a lot of work as we all know. So um, congratulations and thanks. Um, the remarkable range and quality of the papers we've heard today is itself a tribute to the career of Josh Freeman and the influence he's had on generations of historians. Uh, it's been a long day and I will be brief, uh, but I am anxious to add my voice to the celebration of working class New York and to uh, Professor Freeman. I believe I'm the only participant in today's program who can say the following. Josh was a student of mine in one of my classes I came to know him in 1973 when he enrolled in a seminar on the Civil War era that I was teaching in the master's program at City College. 
those were exciting days at City when Herbert Gutman had been brought there as chairman of the history department to revitalize the department. And he was uh, able to hire a group of young scholars, uh, including Leon Fink, who went on to his own major career in labor history, as you all know, Virginia Yans, who has written widely on immigration and other issues, and uh, myself. Um, believe it or not, I still have my class rosters from those days. That was quite a seminar we had. The 14 students included three who went on to stellar careers as historians. One was Steve Fraser, who unfortunately wasn't able to be here, uh, here wherever that is, at the, um, uh, at the conference. Um, Graham Hodges, the author of a path-breaking biography of the black abolitionist uh, David Ruggles, along with other books, and uh, Josh. Um, Josh's term paper was on the connection of slavery to the country's territorial expansion. I'm sure he remembers it well. Uh, and in case people are wondering, he received an A minus for the course. <laughs> but A minus was a respectable grade back then. Today, people complain bitterly if you give them an A minus. Um, unfortunately, the master's program at City was soon discontinued. It became one of the many casualties of the fiscal crisis that we have heard a lot about uh, today. Although I gather it may have been revived uh, somehow more recently. Anyway, a little over 10 years later, I chaired the search committee that hired Josh to teach labor history at Columbia. And from 1987 to 1998, we were colleagues in the history department uh, there. I witnessed at firsthand Josh's commitment, generosity, and insight as a teacher. He was a crucial member of a group of historians, uh, including the late Alan Brinkley, Betsy Blackmar, Barbara Fields, and myself, among others, who worked cooperatively supervising and training uh, graduate students. For a decade, I served with Josh on dissertation committees and orals exams, and we talked informally about the students and about historical questions of all kinds. I saw him again and again ask questions at these gatherings that penetrated to the heart of whatever historical matter was at hand. I witnessed the high quality of the work produced by his students, some of which, some of whom we have heard from uh, today. I found his judgment on questions of historical interpretation, including subjects far afield from labor history, uh, to be consistently well-informed, nuanced, and original. Josh was the model teacher and colleague, and when he departed for the City University, Columbia's loss was definitely CUNY's uh, gain. Now, we've heard a lot today, of course, about Josh's great book, Working Class New York. I want to just reiterate a couple of its stellar qualities. The sweep of the work, the range of sources it draws on, and the variety of the issues it illuminates. The opening chapter is offer an evocative portrait of the world of work in New York City at the close of World War II, a portrait remarkable for its breadth, subtlety, compassion, and care in sketching out the complex patterns of production in what was still the nation's premier port and manufacturing center. Josh understands that the history of labor cannot be studied in isolation from the larger society. And the book brings to life the city's cultural texture, for example, partly by relying on literary as well as conventional historical uh, sources. Uh, it takes on large interpretive questions, including the transformation of the city's politics, the processes of economic change, and the fate of post-war liberalism. Uh, I'm glad it's being republished now because it's a book about the origins of the world that we live in. 20 years after its publication. But to give a fuller picture of Josh's trajectory and accomplishments as a historian, I wanna say a few words about the other books that, uh, that he's written that Steve briefly mentioned, uh, books that given the focus of today's event have not received nearly as much attention. His first book, uh, based on his dissertation uh, about the, the history of the transport work, the transit, Transit Workers Union in the city, 
uh, brilliantly integrated the best aspects of what were then called the old and new labor history, a synthesis that was often called for in the literature of the field at that time, but rarely accomplished. In studying the evolution of a union, the book seemed to fall within the rubric of traditional old labor history. But by placing the transit workers within the broad context of the history of New York City and its politics in general, Freeman succeeded in offering fresh insights on a host of issues generally associated with the new labor history, such as the role of ethnicity in shaping the outlook and tactics of the mostly Irish American transit workers the part played by communists in labor organizing, labor's role in the emergence of New York's distinctive brand of liberal politics, even the economics itself of public transportation and the origins of the city's uh, fiscal crisis. In dealing with these questions, Freeman challenged conventional interpretations, demonstrating, for example, that ethnic identification was a resource for militant organizing, not merely a barrier to class consciousness, and that communists and Roman Catholics could work together for common goals. In 2012, Freeman published to considerable acclaim by reviewers his third book, um, American Empire, an account of the nation's history from 1945 to the year 2000 which goes well beyond the scope of his previous work, but draws on the same talent for combining a synthesis of secondary literature with his own research and interpretive ideas. Uh, this is a volume in the Penguin History of the United States, of which I am the general editor. Um, the first thing I wanna mention is that Josh must be commended for actually writing the book. Uh, that doesn't seem like really much of a thing to compliment, but in fact, um, this five volume series was signed up in the 1990s, although Josh joined a little later than that. And as of today, only three of the volumes have been completed, which is 30 years ago. So we're still um, waiting for two more vo volumes to come in. Uh, so J Josh completed it in a much more expeditiously. Um, of course, many surveys of recent U.S. history existed when Josh was writing, but nearly all were framed by the paradigm of the Cold War. Writing two decades after the end of the Cold War, Josh saw that confrontation as an episode in American history, rather than an open-ended determinant of everything since 1945. He hardly ignored it, but he draw, drew attention to broad themes in political, cultural, and economic history that could not be simply subsumed in the Cold War framework. He candidly identified the United States as an empire, an imperial power, something still too rare in historical scholarship. The book is equally at home discussing domestic and foreign matters, politics, and economics. It represents a remarkable expansion of the focus of Josh's historical writing. Previously, he wrote about the city in a, in a broad context. Now he was writing about the nation as a whole, which is a pretty big step uh, forward. Most recently in 2017, Josh Public Behemoth, A History of the Factory. This book goes even further in, in expanding his coverage and expertise. It sweeps over centuries and around the world. And Josh is as fully at home writing about early factory production in England. He dates the first factory, interestingly, to a silk mill in Derby in 1721. Uh, as, as at home writing about that, as in vividly um, uh, explaining the assembly line system of production of the early 20th century and the giant factories in China that today produce our iPads and iPhones. As in his earlier work, Josh is interested in labor, but also in capital, in class, but also culture. He deals with factories not only as sites of production that transform the world, but as symbols both of progress and exploitation. He explores the lives of the workers who, depending on the time and place, experienced factory work uh, 
as a loss of skill and independence or as an opportunity for uh, economic advancement. So this is another remarkable book, but as I say, really it shows that how in, during his career, he, his, the focus of his work just expanded and expanded in a remarkable uh, manner. I also want to mention Josh's highly influential article published in 1993 on the altercation in 1970 between construction workers or hard hats and anti-war demonstrators in downtown Manhattan. This essay highlighted a certain understanding of masculinity as a key element of working class consciousness, an insight that is as fresh today in the wake of the events of January 6th as when Josh was writing. It's also important to recognize Josh's commitment to bringing historical understanding to a broad public outside the academy. He writes in a style free of scholarly jargon. He's helped curate museum exhibitions. He's a go-to person when journalists want insight about current events related to labor. And uh, as you, what you heard, was a major contributor to writing Who Built America, the pioneering US history textbook that put working people at the center of the historical narrative. Ever since we first encountered each other at City College, Josh has been a loyal friend, always ready to respond to requests for information and advice, always ready with opinions about subjects ranging from the deep meaning of Donald Trump to the failings of the New York Yankees. I wish we could be meeting the old fashioned way today so that I could join all the other participants and Josh and Steve in paying tribute to Josh in person. So what I will do in conclusion is to ask anyone who has persevered today uh, by fortifying themselves with alcoholic beverage to join me in raising a glass in tribute to Josh Freeman and his unmatched contribution to our understanding of history in this glorious and infuriating city and nation. So thank you and congratulations, Josh. Thank you, Eric. Um, Josh, you're up, you bring us home. Uh, well, um, this is pretty overwhelming. Uh, you know, it, 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 uh, what terrific presentations and discussions we've had. It's uh, quite an experience to hear so many people say so many nice things about me. I, I'm not sure they're all true or deserved, but I, I am not so foolish as to uh, reject any single one of them. I'm fully appreciative of it. It's really been a, an amazing day. I can't think of any honor greater uh, than to have so many wonderful scholars and colleagues and activists discussing the issues that I addressed uh, some 20 years ago in, in working class New York. Um, as Eric said, it's been a long day, so I'm going to try to be concise, although I guess I'm, I, I'm, I'm the bar mitzvah boy, so I, I don't have to be that concise, but I will try to keep it short. Let me start by thanking uh, the many people who made this conference possible. Uh, the idea of it actually came from Stephanie Luce, and I just know no one who better embodies what it means to be a scholar, activist, educator than Stephanie. Um, and I have to thank the many colleagues at, at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies uh, who worked very hard to make this possible. I, I particularly want to thank Steve, uh, who's here, and Ruth Milkman, and Penny Lewis, and Michael Allen, and Paula Finn, Antoinette Isabel Jones, Nadia Rahman, and Aaron Lenchner. Without them, this uh, simply couldn't have happened. Um, and I also, like Steve, want to thank the many co-sponsors, but I particularly want to thank the history departments at Queens College and at uh, the CUNY Graduate Center. I, I spent over two decades uh, kind of happily teaching there. You know, I, I, I grew up in a political culture that was alienated from institutions. So it seems very odd to say I, enjoyed working for these institutions and appreciated their support that I did. They were terrific places to work. Um, I also need to thank today's speakers and, and uh, I, I, I wanna start with Eric. You know, his very generous comments have uh, extraordinary meaning for me. You know, I, I had not studied uh, history as an undergraduate. I was actually a science major. I had taken a little bit of uh, English and Russian history, but I 
never took an undergraduate US history course. Uh, but a, a few years out of school uh, with the political movements I had committed myself to in disarray, I, I thought I needed to understand how the country got to where we were. And uh, I also needed a way to make a living. Uh, so I kind of talked my way back then things were much more informal. I kind of talked my way into the MA program at City College, which turned out to be this terrific and also kind of crazy place. Um, earlier today, Torrey talked about, you know, the fact that uh, he took a course with me in, in, in his very first term as a graduate student. I had that experience with Eric in the, in the course on the Civil War era. And, you know, the students were a, a kind of CUNY mix of, of, of school teachers and uh, ed majors and senior citizens. And then there were the people who would kind of stumble into the academy, uh, like myself, not sure what we were doing. Uh, and that included, as Eric mentioned, you know, both Steve Fraser and Graham Hodges, who went on to terrific uh, careers. Um, later, I'll talk to Eric about the grade, but that <laughs> does not have to be addressed right now. Um, you know, as, as you would expect, you know, Eric was extraordinarily uh, knowledgeable and lucid about the issues we considered, but it was his style of teaching that actually had the greatest effect on me. The way he took every student and every student comment seriously, uh, no matter how wacky they were, you know, and he always looked for the sort of valuable germ in everything that anyone said. And in, in my many years of teaching, I've always tried to emulate the democratic classroom ethos that I experienced in that very first uh, course. Um, Steve Fraser and I, you know, we bonded uh, on the steps of Wagner Hall, where the history department was, because neither of us could figure out how you actually register for a course. The city college bureaucracy was beyond the ability of any human to actually understand. And out of that came a, a great friendship. And I've enormously benefited over the years from our collaborations and discussions of history. And he also was the regional editor of Working Class New York. And because of Steve, the book was slated to be published by a major commercial publisher. But then that publisher sort of changed directions and I found my half finished book adrift. Um, but very luckily, Andre Schifrin at the New Press uh, when I sort of explained what I was trying to do in this thing, he, he just sort of got it. And he said, sure, you know, and he, he signed me up. And as a result, I had the privilege of working with uh, not one, but two extraordinary editors, first Steve and then Matt Weiland at uh, the New Press. And, and without their insights and suggestions, um, this book not, would not be what it turned out to be. Um, working with the New Press was a pleasure then and, and remains so. And I am just delighted that the press co-sponsored this conference. And I particularly want to thank its publisher, Ellen Adler, for all of her support. Um, you know, some of the speakers today are, are former students of mine, uh, longtime friends, others are colleagues from recent years, and, and some others I, I, I know just through their scholarship uh, on issues that my uh, book addressed. And I've learned so much from all of them. I particularly want to thank Jack Metzger, not only for his very insightful and generous comments uh, this morning when we started, um, but also for his contributions to the book itself. He actually read every chapter in draft and he uh, just flooded me with wonderful feedback and encouragement. And as many people have said, I, I just wish we could all be in the same room, but uh, it, it, it's great that we can get together this way. I wrote Working Class New York because the literature on the history of labor and the history of New York did not reflect my understanding of the city. Um, I had grown up in New York. I had spent most of my adult life here. When I came back to New York after college, I sort of began clipping things from newspapers and collecting leaflets and, and, and government reports and had file after file, which ultimately, of course, turned out to be very invaluable. And then as Eric mentioned, I wrote my first book on the Transport Workers Union, which touched on New York City politics in the 1950s and 60s. So, you know, even before I began working on working class New York, I had a pretty good sense of labor's achievements and also of the city's myriad communities of, of the poor, of, of working people, of the lower middle class. 
And the sense I had did not match the usual picture of New York City in print. You know, as Kim uh, Phillips Vine mentioned this morning, or uh, the many celebratory books about post-war New York made it seem as if like the only people who lived here were abstract artists and Broadway show people and sort of suave Manhattanites. Um, there were some memoirs and some sociological studies that dealt with more ordinary folk, but they were sort of separate genres. They, they, they were not part of the commonly projected notion of what New York was. And, and this really seemed very odd to me uh, for not only were the vast majority of New Yorkers working people, but collectively they had set so much of the social and cultural and political tone of the city. You know, at least for me, uh, they were what made New York, New York. Um, the effective erasure of, of, of New York's working people reflected a kind of national academic and political drift away from thinking in terms of class, something that Samir Santi mentioned uh, this morning. You know, this had actually become so much so that in the introduction to the book, I felt the need to justify the title and the use of the term working class because uh, I knew that many readers would find it uh, archaic and, and, and jarring. So, you know, part of what I was trying to do in, in working class New York was simply to bring to life, uh, to the extent that I could, the complicated, flawed, glorious world of New York's working people in the post-war decades and expand the notion of what mattered in the history of the city. You know, to a large extent, I think that expansion has occurred over the past two decades, and there's no greater proof of it than the presentations we heard earlier today from Andy Battle and Mark Kagan and Will Jones and Tremlin Addison and Aldo Loria Santiago and Johanna Hernandez, LaShawn Harris, Brian Purnell, and others, you know, which are kind of just a sampling of the best scholarship of recent decades. Uh, compared to what existed when I wrote this book, you know, there's now a pretty large sociological and historical and journalistic literature about the daily lives of New Yorkers, their many subcultures, the housing they live in, the discrimination they face, the, their sexuality, a subject I didn't touch on at all, and their collective struggles. If, if the way the history of New York was told did not make sense to me, the way historians were telling the history of US labor also seemed problematic in light of what I knew about New York. Uh, my generation of labor historians had made major contributions to the understanding of workers and unions, but at least for the 20th century, the orthodox rendering did not, our orthodoxy, did not uh, really fully capture the range of experience. You know, we tended to portray the emergence of the CIO industrial unions during the 1930s and early 1940s as the decisive moment in worker advance. And pretty much everything thereafter was portrayed as declension. Um, but New York didn't look that way in two important respects. You know, first, though the CIO was an important presence in New York, the AFL was considerably larger. Craft unions and unions that combined elements of craft and industrial unionism uh, actually constituted the bulk of the lo local labor movement. Uh, and these organizations were far more inventive and militant than the slight literature on the post-war AFL uh, would have suggested. And second, though the 1930s did see dramatic uprisings uh, of labor in New York, the peak of militancy actually occurred after World War II in the extraordinary strike wave that followed the war. And then again in the 1960s when strikes became so common that A.H. Raskin, the Dean of Labor Reporters at the time, labeled New York strike city. Um, labor historians assume that less was at stake in the post-war strikes than during the earlier period. And there's some truth to that. Uh, by the end of World War II, a new set of structural arrangements uh, associated with the New Deal and the CIO had been put in place. Um, but from the point of view of workers and their families, arguably it was the post-war years, not earlier, that uh, the most dramatic changes 
in the day-to-day -day lives of, of, of folks took place. Cumulatively, over the course of three decades, unionism revolutionized working class life, even if the revolution many labor historians quietly yearned for did not take place. I was not the only scholar fishing in these waters. Jack Metzger's book on steel unionism, which he wrote at the same time I was writing Working Class New York, is the most powerful account we have of how incremental contractual advances after World War II resulted in existential uh, transformation in the lives of workers and their families. Uh, Daniel Clark uncovered a similar story about Southern textile workers in his book, Like Day and Night. And as Samir pointed out this morning, you know, uh, meanwhile, Dorothy Sue Cobble was suggesting that what she called occupational unionism associated with the AFL had been far more dynamic than evident in most historical treatments. And Ruth Milkman, who we heard from earlier, further developed this idea looking at Los Angeles, which in many ways uh, had really displaced New York as the center of union innovation. And, and, and she showed that how some craft unions, which had originated before the New Deal, prove more adaptable to what we might call our current post-New Deal conditions than industrial unions that grew up part and parcel of the New Deal order. Perhaps the thing that most surprised me in doing the research for Working Close New York was the extensive system of social benefits unions created or helped create in New York in the years after World War II. Labor historians had paid very little attention to benefits during the post-war period. You know, it just didn't seem like a very exciting subject compared to organizing drives, or strikes, or radical political groups. But, you know, as I began assembling in my head, you know, the breadth and the depth of labor's accomplishments in helping provide housing and healthcare and social services, not only to its own members, but to New Yorkers in general, I came to see this as one of the greatest accomplishments of the post-war union movement. But it, it was one that had come to be strangely ignored. Um, you know, part of the reason I think was that the people who had been central to creating the various labor, government, and nonprofit uh, benefit schemes had described their work in bland, almost uh, technological, uh, technocratic, excuse me, language. Um, you know, the, the original introduction I wrote to Working Class New York, which for various reasons I ended up abandoning, had in it a very extensive description of a Lechester, which is the nonprofit uh, cooperatively owned housing project in Queens that was sponsored by local three of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Um, this is a big development as over 2,200 apartments. And, and next to it is a small shopping center that's owned by a union benefit fund, which also owns an adjacent six-story building that houses and still houses the headquarters of the local, uh, but also a public library, a union-owned savings bank, a coffee shop, a cocktail lounge that's called the JB Lounge for the Joint Board of the Electrical Industry, a bowling alley, and a 1,200-seat uh, auditorium. You know, and, and I kind of think of this as like the building blocks for a good life. You know, and and, and except for its somewhat bland architecture, I think Electchester arguably is as impressive as the housing projects of Red Vienna. But you know, while Karl Marxhoff is famous around the world, uh, no one except local electricians or Queens denizens has ever heard of, of, of Electchester. Um, similarly with its bland generic name, Penn South, the huge Penn South housing project in Chelsea, uh, no one would know that this was the creation of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union erected so that garment workers could walk to their jobs in Midtown Manhattan, you know, and that, that's where it's worth pausing for a second. You know, what an audacious vision to build thousands of units of nonprofit housing so that ordinary working people didn't have to get on the subway or a car to get to their jobs, you know. Uh, names matter. Rather than proclaiming with great bold names and bold language, the power of labor and the left that made housing complexes like these possible or health plans like uh, HIP or GHI, New York left liberals chose to try to hide in plain sight. 
Um, some of the reason, no doubt, was the pervasive effect of the Cold War Red Scare, the fear that anything that sounded socialistic or communistic would incite uh, attack. Uh, but I think there also was a liberal mindset in the early po post-war years that feared mass movements or mass enthusiasm, that preferred technocratic approaches and language. Uh, and I think we paid a price for not shouting out with daring names and language the achievements of post-war in New York. Every generation now thinks it's starting from scratch. And, and in a way it is, as we lack a collective self-consciousness of past achievements and victories. I myself had difficulty in figuring out how to describe the set of policies and programs and inclinations that the labor movement uh, and left and liberal political organizations and progressive professionals promoted in post-war New York. Um, I ended up using the term social democratic as much for a lack of alternative as anything else. Um, and I should say that at the time I wrote Working Class New York, that term was actually very rarely used to describe any sort of American politics. It was associated with places like Sweden and organizations like the British Labor Party. And among American leftists, who were a pretty small crew, it, it was often a term of derision, uh, not a praise. You know, now, of course, uh, as we heard over and over again today, you know, that term is very commonly used to describe the politics of post-war uh, New York. Um, sometimes I get a little uneasy about that. You know, I've always been a bit queasy about my imprecision in using that term. You know, the panel that we had today on social democracy actually went deeper into what that term actually means and its possibilities and limitations than, than I did anywhere in my book. Um, and that's only one of the many flaws that looking back uh, two decades later that, that I can see in, in, in working class New York. I have to say, uh, some of the panelists uh, today also saw flaws in, in looking back from two decades later, and they were excruciatingly polite about it um, to, the, to their credit or maybe uh, uh, to my gratitude. Uh, and they probably shouldn't have needed to be so polite. Um, my linguistic inadequacies uh, you know, limited my portrayals of immigrant communities and immigrant labor movements, a uh, failing that has since been rectified by a very rich literature we now have on Chinese, Haitian, and Dominican, uh, and Puerto Rican, and other groups of workers, and we've heard some of that today. I also paid far too little attention to the informal economy, to care work, and the chronically unemployed. And I think uh, Premila Nadison earlier today very rightly stressed how important it is to have a much more inclusive notion of, of, of what the working class is than was typical in the past and frankly than was true in this book. And, 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 and uh, I'm so glad that there are scholars like hers and others spoke, spoken today who are now looking at those groups, but more than just adding them, rethinking the whole notion of what the working class life and politics is like as we look at from, from those perspectives as well, as well as others. I also got nailed today on what I think was the biggest mistake in the book, which uh, Will Jones and, and Martha Biondi both caught, you know, which was to imply, if not openly claim, that New York was utterly exceptional uh, in its post-war labor movement and, and working class life. Uh, I made a common error. I did very intensive research about one place and then made implicit comparisons to other places I hadn't studied at all. You know, personally, I hadn't done primary work in. And at the time, there were very few parallel studies of, of other cities that I could turn to to measure what was going on in, in the city. Uh, but I think subsequent research has suggested that some of the features of working class New York and some of the dynamics here were not so unique and could be found in cities like uh, Milwaukee, Detroit, uh, Los Angeles, and elsewhere. And I, I have to say, I think we still need a book that looks nationally at urban working class life and politics in the post-war uh, era. My book had a curious history. You know, it was very generously reviewed in the academic community, but at first it actually didn't have all that much impact. And only later over time, 
to get picked up, especially by generations of graduate students. And, and to my delight, you know, uh, led some of them to topics that were related or, or grew out of it. And, you know, we, we heard the fruits of some of that work today and uh, there's nothing that, that could be more pleasing to me. What was very surprising to me was the attention working class New York received quite quickly in the New York labor movement. Uh, one day, not long after the book came out, I got this phone call from someone at the New York State Federation of Labor saying that Dennis Hughes, the president of the state fed, wanted me to come down to their convention, which was taking place in the Midtown Hotel. Rather mysterious request, but I, I show up there and meet with Dennis Hughes and sort of shouting out of the, over the noise of this uh, convention, he, he starts telling me like, oh, how much you liked my book and how much you learned from my book, you know, and enjoyed reading it. And he wanted me to uh, work with the state fed to revive labor's involvement in developing housing for working people. And sure enough, uh, uh, though in the end it didn't succeed, the AFL-CIO did launch an effort in Albany to get legislation that would have had the state government partner with unions to build housing. Over the years, I found myself writing a column for the TW newspaper, uh, meeting with local 32BJ about building service strikes in the past and how they might conduct them in the future, uh, doing a study for the Central Labor Council on their uh, political efforts and how they might make them more effective, and talking to many, many union groups about labor history. Uh, union, unionists in New York, it turned out, knew history mattered and knew that a lot of labor's historical memory had been lost. Uh, my book became a way of filling the void and nothing could have made me happier. When I stumbled into City College, I thought, you know, maybe I could find a way to not only study history, but to teach it to working people and to impart whatever knowledge, you know, that I, I could gain to their movements. I had been extraordinarily lucky having been able to do exactly that. When I think about New York labor in the years since working class New York, it strikes me how resilient it has been. Uh, no, no doubt its spread and power have been reduced, but as Ruth Milkman uh, uh, detailed earlier, compared to almost everywhere in the country, uh, it remains remarkably strong. And there have been some very important new departures, uh, including the growth of worker centers and the organization of non-traditionally structured labor groups like the domestic uh, workers Union, the Taxi Workers Alliance, the Freelancers Union, the strike, uh, the fight for 15. Uh, also, labor has abandoned the self-isolation, if you want to call it that. They fell into for a while. Uh, now you see union banners at climate change marches, at Black Lives Matter demonstrations, at LBGTQ events, and, and the like. But we need so much more for millions of working people. Life in New York City, even without COVID, has meant inadequate income, little if any power at work, insecure, shamelessly expensive housing, inadequate, deeply segregated public schools, and policing that often feels as much a threat as protection. The discussion we heard in the panel just before this one on what a progressive urbanism could mean is the kind of thinking that has been uh, far too absent. As I wrote Working Class New York, I worried about being romantic or nostalgic, traps that I don't think I completely avoided. Uh, we need to look forward uh, to new solutions to our current social challenges, not to copy or romanticize the past. In the years I wrote about, the fighting spirit, the perseverance, the good humor, and the creativity of working people made New York City a better place. I think they, we can do that again. Thank you. Thank you, Josh, for your final comments and for being you. <laughs> that, was, that was wonderful. Um, just to wrap this up, I want to remind people who are still on the on the conference uh, uh, broadcast here that there are 100 free paperback copies, hopefully still available of Josh's book. And if they haven't already been sold out, if, if they have been sold out, um, New Press has made um, an electronic version of the book available for a, a nominal fee of $5.
you can get that information on, on, on this screen, on the URL on this screen. I wanna thank one and all for today, for making this event such a rousing success. Um, and we've got a lot of work to do and um, we've got a long agenda to, to kind of deal with. And uh, we've got some ideas about how to do that. So thank you one and all for coming and um, take care.